Every time our athletes walk into this weight room, they're going to be pushed to the max. Let's go! Let's go! Let's go! The barbell hasn't changed in over 100 years. I can take a 25-pound plate and we'll go out on the turf and I'll, I'll have you hating life. We talk about straining your gut, pushing past that comfort level. I want a lot of energy. What better breeding ground is there for being a success in life than the weight room? Hey guys, welcome back to Iron Game Chalk Talk. I'm your host, Ron McKeeper, and this is episode number 267. I want to thank you guys for listening each week and really appreciate those of you that like, share, comment. Just helps us highlight the great people that we have in our profession. Also want to thank our sponsors and specifically Versapoy for bringing this episode to you for free. I want to partner with companies that I believe in both the people and the product and uh, Versapoy has fantastic people with Kirsten and, and the entire gang. And uh, the product is top-notch as well. So if you're in the market, please check them out. If not, just let them know how much you appreciate them being a part of the show. This week, I'm joined by a guy that I've had a lot of respect for uh, through the years, followed from afar. Uh, just a guy that is a great ambassador for our profession, doing it the right way, and, and uh, excited to have him on. So uh, excited to have Bill Gillespie, the assistant AD of strength and conditioning at Liberty University. Thanks for coming on the show, Coach. Thank you. Ron, it's truly an honor, and I'm humbled by you asking. Appreciate it, man. Well, hey, Coach, you, you've been at Liberty for a long time, but um, you you know you were it, it spent a little bit of time at Washington, spent a little time with Seattle Seahawks. Uh, you coached a little high school football there for a while. Um, <laughs> you're, you've been at Liberty for how many years now, total? This is my 14th season back. And let's see, I was there, I was here 13 years before that as a student and as a coach. Before, uh, <laughs> quite some time, but what, I mean, obviously you probably, most of the time people, I'll, I'll ask people what was the, the experience that they felt like they grew up or they became who they are at this point, you know, that might be liberty if that's the case for you. If it is, um, let us know a little bit. I mean, I just, I'm curious to how you can stay at a place for so long. I mean, it's so hard in this profession yeah. at, at one place, either be it, you know, you get let go for whatever reason, or, uh, you know, you get this grass is greener type of mentality. How have you been able to protect against that? Well, um, I, I really believe in Liberty. I, uh, I wasn't raised in the church. It's a Christian school. And I wasn't raised going to church. Uh, I didn't go to church until my senior year in high school. And I didn't receive uh, Jesus Christ. I didn't become a Christian until my, going uh, after my senior year in high school. And uh, where I could play football at a Christian school. And I had never heard of a Christian school before. And, uh, in fact, when I asked for my first question I asked was if I was going to have to wear a robe because I thought I was going to a monastery, you know. <laughs> and, uh, they told, you know, and they told me, no, there would be a lot of rules. But, you know, I thought, well, that's nothing wrong. I can handle that. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm from Tacoma, Washington. So I got on a bus and I rode a bus 84 hours, uh, four days to come here and walk on. I didn't know a soul. And um, I loved it here. And, uh after I, I, I graduated, I went and coached track and field, and I coached, uh, uh, went into being a straight coach, and then the opportunity to go back home at the University of Washington came open, and my wife and I both agreed that would be a great opportunity, so we went back and I really had a wonderful time coaching there, I had a wonderful time coaching with uh, Seattle, and my mentor, Dave Williams, called me one day and said, hey, uh, what do you think about us working together again? And I'm like, well, what do you got planned? And he goes, I want to step down and I want you, I want to be your assistant. I want you to come back and take over. And, uh, he, he made it work. He was, Dave Williams is my hero. And, um, so, uh, my wife and I talked about it and we said, okay, let's do it. So, uh, I walked away from the NFL and, uh, came back and, um, you know, the chancellor of the school promised me that if I came, uh, he would make this place into a big-time football program, and this is our first year at FBS football. So it's awesome. Uh, the facilities here are unbelievable. Uh, we're spoiled. Uh, our, our football building is uh, 12 years old. It's the oldest athletic building on campus, and they're going to tear it down at the end of the football season and rebuild it. So. Wow. 
Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, it's been it's been awesome to see the growth. And I even I even looked at Liberty as, coming out of high school as a play being recruited by him. Um, yeah. And uh, just a phenomenal place, and, and and I share the mission and the faith and being faith based, and mm-hmm. you know, so it's, it's incredible there to uh, to not only you know to choose. I think so many times as young coaches, you you're, you're, you got this grass is greener mentality instead of just going and picking a place that you believe in, both the people, yeah. uh, the institution, and just saying you know what I'm going to plant a flag in the ground and uh, make it great. And, and you've obviously done that there. What it didn't. What it looked like 14 years ago isn't the same as what it looks like now. now no, you know. by any means, you know. But it, it, I have purpose with my life. I'm not just helping a school uh, get better. I'm not just helping a coach be successful. There's a purpose behind what I'm doing. And uh, quality of life is really important to my wife and I. Uh, my wife is very successful. She runs uh, nine mammography centers here in the central Virginia area. And so – we make plenty of money, so you know when we make more money, we just we live by pretty humble means, and we just put our money in the bank. So why I don't know why should I go and pursue more money if my life is happy? You know, exactly. I have fulfillment, I have purpose. I get up in the morning, I'm so excited about coming to work and and investing my life in these young men. You know, that's the that's that's what it's all about. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter what logo is on your chest. It's all about you know. Having having a, a pretty desire to, to do it and uh, show up every day and uh, like you said, I mean having a great quality of life and ha- you know I know you have two kids and mm-hmm. wife they love very much and and that that's the home team is the most important team by far. Yeah. You 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 know you don't you're not in this profession for you know what almost close to three decades now, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, not in this field for that long without making a lot of mistakes along the way. What's what's one of the biggest mistakes you made and how you learned from it? The biggest mistake I made was um, back in the early 80s, high-intensity training became really – and I was a shot putter. And uh, going in my uh, – I, I did the five-year plan. And my fourth year, uh, I was I finished second at the indoor national championships in the shot put for small colleges. And I thought, man, this is going to be a great year. I'm going to uh, come back my senior year and I'll have a great year. Well, I got involved in this high intensity training, and I went from being a 60 foot shot putter to a 51 foot shot putter. And this young guy from a small school, he was a um, uh, a, a 39 foot shot putter and all of a sudden he became a 49 foot shot putter and so we were like 21 feet apart and because we both changed our training methods we became two feet apart in our competition and I said that's it man I'm never going to make that mistake again I, I, I involve uh, even in the training of my athletes even in my own personal training I still involve some high intensity training it's not like I'm against it but uh, I saw how much it was detrimental to my performance as a, a track and field athlete. Yeah, I think that's an easy mistake to make. It was one of the things that I, I credit my, you know, just the, the coach that I am today is coming from two extremes. I was I was extreme uh, Olympic lifting mm-hmm. growing up. You know, I trained with Istvan Javorik and and mm-hmm. um, Tom Cross, and and then you know I ended up going to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, which was truly a, a pure high intensity team, and yeah. having those two extremes and kind of seeing them both work to some degree. Um, I was like, you know, that, that that allowed me to have an open mind to different types of training modalities and not be close minded to any one philosophy, which I think is the key. It's it's it's, yeah, it's, totally. it's, it's play, placing little pieces in in different points, and so I couldn't agree with you more on that. The coach, I mean, you're, what, what's 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 your all time best on the bench press now? My bench press? Yeah, your all time best. My all-time best is 804. I'm um, 50. I'll be 59 next month. And last March, I just missed locking out 825 in a meet. And, Good and, Lord. I, and of course, I'm a lifetime drug-free athlete. So yeah, I mean, it's just un- incredible. And obviously, you know, genetics and, and all those types of things. But I mean, there's there's definitely a big piece of that is the type of training that you've done and the you know and and all, all the effort that you put into that. 
Talk a little bit. I mean, you and I, are, we, we, when we were talk, uh, doing some research for this episode, you, you had a statement that was, you know, training for strength as opposed to expressing strength. You know, so talk a little bit about the difference there. Okay. Um, what people need to first understand is that I wasn't gifted as a bench presser. I came out to the very first drug free national powerlifting championships in 1983 and benched 341. Okay, I didn't have a bad day. At the age of 35, my bench was stuck at 444.50, and I just said, forget it. I'm going to just – I've been had been exposed to some great coaches, uh, uh, the Russian coaches, and I took the Russian training manuals and the information that I gave, and I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to develop my own bench press technique, uh, training program. And what, what people need to understand, especially younger strength coaches, is back in the day when, you know, up until the mid-'90s, we didn't have access to all this information. You know, there were no podcasts. There was no Internet. And so we had to dig in to find out what information was true, what information was legitimate, and how it would be applied. And then you had to go and develop it. And so a lot of us had to develop our own philosophies and, and programming. And so this is what I did. And I found out from uh, the, a lot of the powerlifters, that a lot of stuff that they were writing in magazines weren't true. They weren't doing those programs. So I developed my own, and um, and then my bench press just took off. And one of the things that I've learned, my son and I have been the uh, world's strongest bench press uh, uh, father-son for the last 15 years. Uh, he benched 462 pounds when he was 16 years old in competition. Wow. And uh, yeah, he, he, he he's been he's gifted he's pretty strong and uh i always say it's because of my wife's cooking you know (laughs) there's more truth to that than you'll ever know but um i I, he constantly wants to express to me new training methods and he'll say dad i got this crazy new idea um it really works on my bench is really going up and i ask him i says well, is that helping you exhibit strength or is that helping you develop strength? He goes, what do you mean? I says, there's a huge difference. I says, there are exercises. So simply like if you're training one to three reps, that's helping you exhibit strength where you're training like four to six reps, that's helping you to develop strength. And I think I, personally I have found that you need to be doing a little of both at all times because I think that the more you are able to exhibit strength, the more you can handle more heavier weights to develop your strength. And right. so it, 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 you can't just go and say, I'm all into exhibiting strength. That would be fun. But after a while, you see these dwindling results. So that's what uh, young strength coaches I always ask them. I said, well, what phase of training are you in? And is that exercise to develop strength or to exhibit strength? And, and they're like a kind of, confused but i'm it, there's a world of difference and um you know having that little bit of high intensity background helps you understand that's high intensity training isn't going to help you uh, exhibit maximum strength but sure can you be used to develop strength potential yeah i agree yeah i could yeah that's awesome i think that's such an important lesson for for the coaches listening is that um is that there's you know you got to train for different qualities and and you, and you got to be consistent about that and understand that there is there is a continuum there you know mm-hmm. that that exists when you see um you know these, these strength coaches but I mean you you've you've had however many strength coaches come through Liberty since you've been there you oh, know yeah, what's what's one of, what's some of the biggest mistakes you see when they're when they're coaching either bench press technique or lack thereof even. Oh, uh, the biggest problem I run into is, um, let's say we've been training a young man with a 300 pound uh, training max, and his bench press goes up to say 400 pounds. Everybody thinks that if you put on makes his next training max at 400 pounds, he's going to make great gains. And you're like, you're crazy. The tonnage goes through the roof. You can't handle it. If you made great gains at 300 pounds, then just go to 315. You're going to keep making great gains. It's not can you handle the weight, but can you handle the tonnage. And what happens is is is, is you lose too much bar speed. Uh, I see people training all the time, don't understand bar speed. There's too many young strength coaches. They think I get, I get so many people who think that I'm all into nothing but lifting heavy weights. And um, I love to lift heavy, no question about it. But I get there by moving the bar fast. It's like being, I, I used to be a track coach, and I use this illustration all the time. 
if I ask you to run 60 yards, we all understand exactly what the expectation is going to be, right? Right. Okay. All right. You run 60 yards and turn around and you start jumping up and down and telling me, I did it, I did it, I did it. We're like, everybody's going to like, you're a moron. Stop it. All right. And so if I wanted you to make you faster, I certainly wouldn't go and turn and tell you, go, we're going to go run a mile. And we're going to run it hard. And it's going to make you so tired, you might even puke. But we know it's not going to make you faster, right? Right. Okay. And it's going to, not going to help you develop your speed. So if you're running to develop speed and you're running 60 yards, I'm going to turn to the athlete and if he tells me that was easy. I'm simply going to tell him, run the next one faster, right? Okay. Now, we all understand that. That's so simple. Everybody understands it. Now, we put 60% on the bar. It's easy, coach. I can do this. Yeah, no kidding. All right. Well, let's put more weight on the bar. No, I don't want to put more weight on the bar. Just move it faster. And yeah. that's the concept that most people, most strength coaches, they they add too much weight to the bar, and they 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 the technique falls apart, and they're not training the velocity that they need to develop strength. It's like uh, if I had a ball throwing competition with my quarterback, okay. And I, and, and I threw a baseball and he threw a wiffle ball. All right. I throw the bait. I throw it further because a wiffle ball is too light. All right. Now we're going to switch it around. This time I'm going to throw a softball, but he's going to throw a shot put. Well, again, I'm going to throw it further because the shot put's too heavy. So the key is when you pick to do weight selection is that you pick weights that are not too light and not too heavy. You don't want to spend all your time lifting wiffle balls. You don't want to spend any hard, all their time lifting shot puts. You want to find out where are your baseballs, where are your softballs, and dial the athlete in. And it varies from athlete to athlete, but that's why we use a lot of velocity-based training, particularly in season, to help our kids uh, actually get stronger during football season. I have a real pet peeve in guys getting strong in the off season, and I'm like, you're a football player. If I was the track coach and I told my guys, I'm going to make you really, really fast in the off season, but during track season, we're just going to try to maintain, they think I was crazy. That's great. Right? Yeah. If you're a football player, you should be training to be your strongest during football season. Right? It just makes too much sense. So the whole key in the off season is to set up so that the athletes has the work capacity and the knowledge to be able to develop strength during the season. And that's, I think it's key. And I, I'm, I'm just like anybody else. I can't lift heavy, and I have very, very limited time to lift the guys during the season. But our athletes get stronger during the football season. They test out better at the end of the season than they do at the beginning of the season. Yeah, I, I, I want to dig into that. Um, I want to, I want, I got one more question about bench press and that, uh -huh. you know, uh, as I mentioned earlier, and, and you would agree, I mean, there is a continuum there, especially with a football player. You know, you, you're, you're, if you're, if you're only put, I mean, never just saying, okay, I'm just focused on power, I'm just focused on strength, I'm just focused on speed. Okay. You know, there is a continuum there that has to be constantly developed. And in that eight week off season, that eight week summer, that eight week, uh, you know, winter block, what, what is that? You know, to, to specifically, and, and, and we all know that your best bench pressers aren't always your best football players and vice versa. Yeah. But there is a, there is, you know, it's a generally accepted, you know, uh, measure, I guess, within football to have a good bench press, right? So mm -hmm. what does that eight weeks look like for you? I mean, what is it? I mean, and just globally, not, you know, what's that program look like? Well, I like the fact that you brought up it, 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 there's, it, there's a lot more involved than just bench pressing. Right. And I think the biggest mistake people make is that it, it, throughout the year, they have a period of time where they're just focused on making them big and strong. And I, and I don't like building an artificial strength base in the off season. I don't care how strong you are in the off season. All I care about is how can I prepare you to be your strongest during football season? So I have to have some type of emphasis of conditioning year round so that it doesn't allow you to develop a bigger bench. When I'm getting ready to compete, I'm certainly not going to spend very much time doing a lot of conditioning. Uh, I got two guys I coach, uh, 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 Jonah, um, uh, uh, Jonah Leo and Adam Amola. They're two of them, uh, the IPF, USAPL, best bench pressers in, um, in, in, that we have in America. When we went to Denmark to compete, 
the two of them rented cars because they didn't want to walk a quarter of a mile to the venue because they wanted to save their energy for the bench press. Okay. That's how, that, and <laughs> that's how bad it can be. Um, uh, but with a football player, if, if you go and you stop training their legs, you stop doing so much conditioning, their bench press is going to take off. And, and then all of a sudden you go and you start going in through training camp, the bench press is dropped. That's why I joke around and say, I, I, I don't need an Omega wave. I don't need to have all this stuff. I got the Omega bench press. The bench press will tell me so much about a kid. If he can't get his reps and everybody else is getting the reps, then I know he's not resting right. He's not sleeping right. He's not right. eating right. It's t- I can tell exactly the, what the ben- if from the bench press what's going on. Um, if they're making too big of a games, you know, I'm like, you know, they go home. I'm like, oh, no, I know he's not doing his conditioning. Uh, you know, get it right. Me. Coach, you can't believe how good my bench is going. Oh, no. <laughs> you know, I know you're not running, you know. So, <laughs> so I think it's important that uh, – during the off season, you're setting the stage and you're developing their work capacity. Um, I, we focus on a very narrow aspect of the bench press. Uh, we don't go. Uh, uh, how do I describe it? We we, we we do some west side, all right, no question about it. But I also do some volume uh, with reps. Um, but I don't like training over six repetitions. I love five by five. Um, I found I could get away with personally. I could you, I could do if I had to pick anything, I'd do five by five. And if that's all I did, my bench would go really pretty darn good just by doing that. Right. Um, but uh, and and then we're very selective on our assistant list. Um, constantly hitting a t- tons of variations. We don't don't just do the same ones week after week. Um, Rick Hugley from the University of Washington. After I worked with him taught me that pull-ups and weighted dips, two best exercises for the bench press, and I still stand by that to this day. Great exercises for your bench press. Uh, we do sets of sixes. Uh, my kids think of pull-ups are just like something. I don't care how big you are. Uh, everybody's doing pull-ups. Yeah. You know? But then here's the really cool thing is, is, for, is, is we develop this work capacity during the off-season. And we try to increase our tonnage by increasing the ability to handle the workload. But then during training camp, we already have established a workload. So then what we do is by, we, by increasing the workload, we don't increase the amount of weight that we do, but we condense the turnovers. Because every, when we do a bench workout, if we're on our third set of bench, everybody in the weight room is on their third set of bench. Okay, So we do all-time turnovers. So what I do is I take the same workout that they did like towards the end of July and I condense it so that the turnover periods become shorter and shorter and shorter so that when the season comes as their conditioning level goes uh, increases during training camp, they can handle doing the workout with a shorter rest interval, which allows me to um, uh, uh, prepare them for the end season workouts because I don't have very much time. Right. In, fact, in fact, we're thinking about putting it out public. Um, uh, we did a bench workout. Now, it was only four sets of two at 60%, but the whole team did the whole bench workout in 60 seconds. Really? Yeah, it was so, it's, it's so cool to watch these big old linemen running around, changing the weight, spotting each other. And, oh, my gosh, it's <laughs> phenomenal to watch. But they wanted to, they loved it. And right. I told them, I said, cannot be no compromise in technique. No, no, but nobody can be uh, has to have a spotter. And it was phenomenal to watch these guys work so fast. But they taught them that they cap- they're capable of uh, handling uh, a workout with a very, 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 very short rest interval. Right. Um, another trick I did, I do, and and I love this one. Okay, Go, I'm gonna tell show this because other coaches. Uh, losing upper body muscle hypertrophy is definitely something that most strength coaches uh, experience during training camp. And uh, we train our kids right up to training camp, okay? We, the two days before they report, we got a weight workout. So th- most of the time, if, if most strength coaches will tell you, um, you know, getting guys to work that close to training camp is next to impossible. Well, I found a way that I can get them to do extra, extra, extra sets and they want to do it, uh, and, and it works in a lot of other positive ways. What we do is when they report, the very first day they ever report to us, we have them take their shirt off and we take a picture of them, 
the before picture. And then that last workout, we bring them in and we set up a bodybuilding workout. And we lather them up, man. We get them all pumped up. And then we bring in our photographer, all right? And we got coconut oil. We, like, we put the coconut oil on them. And they get all pumped up and they get their picture taken. Well, these cats will sit there all day long. I run out of time. I'm like, guys, we're running out of time. <laughs> you know, they're sitting there killing themselves. But I, what I get is I get a great upper body hypertrophy workout before camp starts. Right. I get uh, the, the before and after pictures, and the kids start to see, wow, I've improved. They like the way they look, so sure. they're going to come back and continue to work hard during training camp. So it's a win-win-win situation, and uh, that's a neat trick that I have uh, I just did just a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, no, it's fantastic. <laughs> I think any time you get motivated, that's, I mean, that's going to override a lot of bad programs, good programs, everything in between, you know, for sure. Well, you know, you mentioned in season and, and I mean, you talked a little bit about some of the tactics you use. What about, you know, like you mentioned the, 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 the two lifters you got that rented a car. I mean, these, these guys, you know, when you're in the middle of the season and you're a lineman and you're just getting beat up nonstop, you know, every single day, how are you accounting for, the, just the not 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 necessarily injuries that it doesn't happen as well. Right. Just the, I mean, you just don't feel it a hundred percent. Yeah, you feel hundred percent. Well, we don't go heavy. That's for one thing. All right. Um, the heaviest last year on a lower body lift, either a clean or a squat, was eighty percent for one set of never went heavy. Um, but we had the tendo on it on every lift, on every lift, the clean, the squat, the bench press. And we measured the velocity of the movement and force, the force against the bar is what we're depending upon developing our strength in season. Now, we can't get away with doing that very long because the um, it, it just doesn't last very long. You don't have enough muscle hypertrophy for you to be able to sustain it. But it's a very accurate type of strength for the game of football. And the kids test out even better. One of the things that, on the cleans, our, we got some kids who can clean really well. Big weight here. My, Last clean, I had a kid hang clean uh, a year and a half ago, 475, uh, wow. without doing a squat clean. Uh, and But we never cleaned ever, ever. Um, I found that by training the clean with more than 80%, then what happens is, is I have to go and reduce my volume in my uh, other list, particularly the squat. And they be, the two positives become a negative. And right. I found that when, you, when I worked at the University of Washington, the kids had to get a new PR, and they said, Coach, I can't train the clean because every time I train the clean, I don't get a new PR, and then Coach gets mad at me. So right. I experimented with doing lighter cleans, and all of a sudden, bam, everybody's cleaning big weight. So this is where the philosophy of the 60% versus 60 yards came from. Just move it faster, perfect the technique. When it comes time to max, we max. And right. uh, I've, I've had 22 players clean over 400 pounds here. Wow. Wow. It's incredible. Especially uh, at an FCS school for the majority of that time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 I don't get, I don't get the great athletes, you know, <laughs> no, 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 you know, no offense to my kids, but they are good guys, but they're not, they're, I've been at Washington. I know what you get. You know? Sure. Well, when you're talking manipulating either the, the volume or the intensity or the speed, are you waiving that through the season, depending on uh, competition, depending on off week, things like that, or are you try to? Are you just focused on speed during the season? It's it's pretty much always on speed and the um, the, the the volume. What I it is basically I go uh, I increase the volume every week for basically the first six weeks, and then I decrease the volume for the next six weeks. But it's so minute that my players sometimes think that they're doing the same workout week after week. I mean, it's minute, the difference. And what I don't want to do is I don't want to create a, a massive change in what they're doing. Um, when I was with the Seahawks, uh, I would go out and watch the pre-practice warm-up, and they would do the most basic drills over and over every day, twice a day. And I, I asked some of the players, I'm like, why do you do the same drill, do drills over and over and over again? They said, because these are the ones that are going to make us better and 
we want to perfect those and we don't need to worry about all the other stuff. And so I went, hey, wait a minute. I know, I know what lifts are going to make my kids play better football. I'm going to focus on those and I'm going to let them do them week after week after week. And let's see how good they can become. And, and, and yeah, you're right. If there's an injury, yeah, it does hinder us. But I have kids who progress so well. Um, so gradually on the bench press, they'll be they'll be lifting new personal records on the bench press, and it's easy. I mean, it's just the bars just popping right up, and you're like, they're like, I got a new max. I said, no, you just lifted more than you've ever lifted. It's not a max. And they're like, yeah, you're right, coach. I can do a lot more. And I'm like, yeah, but we're not going to do that today. And right. I, I mean, we may go up uh, two and a half pounds a week. That's it. I buy I buy a little one and a quarter pound plates. And uh, it, it's a, that's why I say it's an insignificant jump. They can't tell the difference. Right. Like that little progression, two, three, four weeks later, all of a sudden they realize, whoa, I'm using more weight than I did earlier, and it feels easier. Yeah, that's great. That's yeah, great. Right. Well, Coach, we end the show here with some resources. Give us the best piece of coaching advice you ever received. Best pe- oh, coaching advice I ever received. Um, the best advice. Was back in the early 80s. I was reading a U.S. Uh, weightlifting uh, pamphlet, and there was one paragraph that talked about reach the, the Bulgarians and how they return from a joint injury. And they said what they do is when you come back from a joint injury, you want to introduce compound exercises with light weight, obviously. But what do we always do? 10 reps. Yeah. And they said, no, use one to three reps. So what I do is I go six sets of two with a weight that's so stupid light that the kid's embarrassed. He's like, man, coach, this is a waste of my time. And I said, I agree, but let's look, let's look at the tonnage. If you did five sets of two with a hundred pounds today, that's a thousand pounds more than you lifted yesterday. That sounds like a lot, doesn't it? And they go, well, yeah, when you put it like that. And I'm saying, yeah, and tomorrow you can come back and do the same exercise again, but we can a little more weight. And by doing it, by focusing on increasing the weight from the six sets of two, it's like magic. It's unbelievable. In fact, it's been so good. There's times I'll replicate that for our lower body squat routine. I've had miraculous, miraculous results from utilizing that training method. Yeah, I love that. Love that. I'm going to have to give that a go. Yeah. And everybody goes light, they want to go tens. And I'm like, man, you're just tearing that joint apart. That's what they said. So you're doing too many repetitions, tearing the joint down. You want to strengthen the joint, so stick with the low repetitions and gradually increase the weight. Makes sense. Makes yeah. sense. Give us a uh, book, app, and website recommendation. Um, uh, the books I love are uh, anything by Louis Simmons. Love Louis Simmons. Uh, um, I think Josh Bryant is for developing the raw bench pressing uh, is is out there so far ahead of everybody else. He's a genius. I love I love Josh. I've you know spent some time with him. Um, uh, uh, I don't even know how to pronounce his name. The Russian coach. That I have pioneered everything from the multi-year uh, training manual, but I, I uh, that's where I pioneered all my stuff. But to be honest with you, now uh, Mel Sip took all that information and put it in super training. Right. I, 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 I cannot understand for the life of me why any young strength coach wouldn't just memorize super training. It's just, <laughs> it's just, that's the best thing I've seen out there. Right. What about an app and a website? My website. Okay, now here we go. This has been a good this one. has been one of my secrets, man. And I've I've I get out. like a, you know, it's only put out to about ten thousand coaches, so don't worry about it. Yeah, I know. I know. Your time, it's a little secret. <laughs> I have, I can sound like a genius at times because I could I get all this research and I don't need I'm not a I'm not an internet guy that well, but some way some way I lucked into this website. And my son's he, he's an IT director. Okay, for a manufacturing company. And I found the website way before him, and I used to just like throw all these facts out to him, and he'd be like, Oh my gosh, Dad, where do you get all this stuff? Oh, you know, research. I was getting it all from the same place. One time I messed up and I talked about something too precise, and he went, Oh, I found it. I'm like, Oh, but it's uh, ergo, 
www.ethicsdash-log.com. And I'm going to tell you, you get on there and you want to study testosterone. And you could go and just site after site. You want to read about uh, uh, honey. You want to read about any kind of supplement. Uh, it's really cool. And they always put a disclaimer if a, a product was, you know, research was sponsored by the uh, company so you you know the truth and so i really really like that website I, it's, I check it if i said i checked it once a day I, that's not really true i check it about three times a day. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta go out there and sound like you're smart three times a day right yeah exactly <laughs> oh. well coach I, I mean like i said at the beginning man you, you're you're one of the guys that every you know i mean along the way every through the, I mean, I've co been coaching 24 years and, and, uh, always been able to point to you as a, as a guy that's doing it the right way. Um, like I said, you planted a flag and just made it great and, and you continue to do it with great humanity, even though you're one of the best in the world, both in coaching and bench press and all that. So I, I appreciate you. I appreciate how you go about your business and I really appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you, Ron. I, I, hey, I'll tell you what, my staff, has done an incredible job. Uh, they, the school here has really gotten behind us. Um, there, there, there are, a, a quick, really cool story. Like you've never heard this before. Um, our president goes out to dinner with our recruits, the president of our university. Okay, and they're out to dinner one time, and uh, he gets a phone call from an unknown number. He answers it, and he goes, "Hello," and he goes. Hey, this is Donald Trump. What you doing? He goes, well, I'm out to dinner with our head football coach and a recruit. He goes, who's your head football coach? He goes, Turner Gill. He goes, Turner Gill, that same guy was the quarterback at Nebraska in the early 80s. He goes, I love that guy. Let me talk to him. Puts him on the phone. He's on the phone talking with the president. And Coach Gill says, yeah, he says, I'm here with a recruit. And the recruit. He goes, President says, let me talk to that recruit. He goes, son, he goes, let me tell you something. He goes, I went and I spoke at Liberty. He says, and that's the greatest school. You should definitely go to school there at Liberty. So we're the only school in the world that had the president for us. So. <laughs> Incredible. But the, 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 but the school gives us so much support. They want us to be successful. When you got a president of the university going to uh, dinner, Hey, it makes a difference, and they've given me the equipment. They're they're updating our equipment here in the next year and a half. They, they give me an incredible staff. My staff's phenomenal. We're best friends. It allows us to really focus and take and coach these guys up. And and we're our football coach and the school is all into development of athletes. So kids that may not have been recruited, may have been overlooked, come in here and all of a sudden, boom. We don't care if you're a five star when you come in. We care if you're going to be a five star when you walk out. Yeah, that's and awesome. uh, that's the whole philosophy here. That's what it's all, and that's ultimately what it's all about. What we do is develop people. Yeah, you know? that's uh, it's great to have that kind of support, man. I re like I said, I really appreciate you coming on and sharing every everything with everybody. Thank you, Ron. I appreciate you inviting me. It's been very much an honor. That's it for this episode of Iron Game Chalk Talk. Thanks to this week's guest as well as our sponsors for bringing this episode to you for free. Make sure to check out ronmckeefree.com where you can join our mailing list, find the show notes, including all the links and resources mentioned, and information about Coach McKeefree's other products. While you are there, please join Coach McKeefree in the comments section thanking our guest for sharing. If you haven't subscribed to Iron Game Chalk Talk on YouTube or iTunes yet, make sure to do so. Comments, ratings, and reviews are always welcome. Coach McKeefree can be found on Twitter at rmckeefree on Facebook and YouTube at forward slash Ron dot McKeefrey. That's it for this week. Be sure to check back next week for another great episode of Iron Game Shock Talk.